From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Kaylee Lines, I'm Joe Matthew. Former President Donald Trump says states should decide abortion policy, sidestepping a position on a national ban. We'll have more on voters' views on the issue with Cliff Young of Ipsos Polling. President Biden visiting the swing state of Wisconsin today, outlining a plan B to relieve student loan debt for more than 30 million Americans as he aims to court young voters. And Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says there is a date for an invasion of Rafah as Congress returns to Washington to grapple with funding for both Israel and Ukraine. We'll speak with former Congresswoman Jane Harman, chair of the National Defense Strategy Commission. So, Joe... It is a Monday in Washington. Yes, Parts indeed. of Congress are back. The House comes back tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And in short order, they may have to deal with a number of issues on funding for America's allies. And, of course, it was Donald Trump that was capturing all the news before they returned to the Capitol. Well, that's for sure. Uh, he told us it was coming, an mm-hmm. announcement on uh, reproductive rights, his abortion policy as he runs for re-election. Some folks were wondering it might be a number of weeks, how he might frame a potential national ban It was none of the above. Here's the former president from earlier today. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both. And whatever they decide must be the law of the land. In this case, the law of the state. Joining us now for more is Nancy Cook, Bloomberg National Politics reporter. So, Nancy, after all of the reporting about him possibly supporting a 15-week ban, for example, the teasing that this policy is coming, it turns out that the policy is just, I don't have a policy at the federal level. This is up to the state. So that's it. His position is exactly the same as it was a year ago, is that he is just saying, you know, I appointed Supreme Court justices who overturned the federal right to an abortion. I'm leaving it to the states, and there is absolutely no change. Abortion has been really the quagmire for Republicans, uh, you know, really since Roe was overturned. They have not figured out kind of what is next for the party. The party is fractured over what it wants. And, and Donald Trump really views this as a politically radioactive situation. His top advisors have urged him, based on my reporting, to not take a position. There are a bunch of anti-abortion people who want him to put a more specific ban in place at the 15-week mark. He shied away from doing that. And so it's really his attempt to try to neutralize what is the Republicans' biggest vulnerability heading into 2024. Meanwhile, the Democrats are gleeful over this announcement, and they're going to keep using it to uh, really try to bludgeon him on the campaign trail. Well, of this it's really policy. interesting as he tried not to be handcuffed by a number, a number of weeks, for instance, to your point, mm-hmm. counseled not to do that. He also upset a lot of evangelicals. Mike Pence was speaking for them today, Nancy. I'm sure you saw his post on X. President Trump's retreat on the right to life is a slap in the face to the millions of pro-life Americans who voted for him in 2016 and 2020, he writes. We saw uh, similar refrains from others in the community. Lindsey Graham, for instance, who was pushing for a 15-week uh, national abortion ban, not happy with Donald Trump. Did he do more good or more damage? Well, I think that what his play is to try not to alienate uh, swing voters and white suburban women, and that is really what he is looking towards the general election. I think that he thinks the Republican base is already going to support him, including people who don't like abortion. And so he's trying to preserve um, some goodwill with some other voters that he hopes to win over. Mm -hmm. And of course, over the weekend, we saw a big fundraiser down in Florida, the Trump campaign raising more than $50 million, roughly double what Biden, together with Clinton and Obama, the former presidents, raised in New York earlier this month. But we also know that in the month of March, Biden and the Democrats pulled in $90 million. So Trump is still playing catch up here in the fundraising race, and he just had a lot of donors max out for this entire cycle. He did. I mean, what the Trump campaign is trying to do is they're trying to say, hey, look, this is the kickoff fundraiser. 
we're going to have a bunch of other people join us. There are a bunch of billionaires who have supported Republican causes in the past. I'm thinking of Ken Griffin, Steve Schwartzman of Blackstone, uh, Miriam Adelson, who have not given money to Trump yet, according to the federal election filings. Um, but, you know, what this dinner was meant to show was that the donor, the Republican donor class is starting to come around to him. I would say, though, he's not fully there yet, and fundraising still remains a weak spot for him compared to Biden. Yeah, the numbers don't lie. Nancy Cook, great to have you with us as we get things started on a Monday. Meantime, President Biden visiting the key swing state of Wisconsin today, outlining his plans to forgive student loans for as many as 30 million Americans. Here he is. Today, I'm proud to announce five major actions to continue to relieve student debt for more than 30 million Americans since this, I started my administration. This relief can be life-changing. Let's get into this now with Jordan Fabian, Bloomberg White House reporter. Uh, you might have deja vu on this one, Jordan. We've already done this, right? The Supreme Court said the first approach was not going to work. This is a plan B, as we've been reporting. They're trying to more carefully designate I guess, classes of, uh, of, of loan holders who they can target here. Will it make a difference from a legal standpoint? Only the courts can decide that. They have tried to make it more tailored, like they're targeting groups like people who, whose balances are more than their principles, people who are eligible for relief but haven't gotten uh, a, an application in. Uh, but look, it's going to be up to the court system to decide whether that uh, is is in fact true that this is targeted enough that Biden could do it by himself without Congress. Mm -hmm. And this is not going to be resolved before the election. Uh, I would imagine there are going to be a lot of groups who are going to file lawsuits very soon. And we've seen how slow the court systems work. So for all those young voters out there who are uh, mm -hmm. looking for this debt relief, it might not be coming for uh, quite a bit longer, if at all. But Clearly, this is aimed at trying to make those young voters feel better about President Biden, knowing that he was speaking in Madison, Wisconsin today, one of the areas where in the Wisconsin primary you saw a large percentage voting uninstructed instead of for him in protest over his Israel policy. So is this the way that the Biden campaign sees it's the best chance of drawing those young voters upset over Israel and Gaza back into Biden's fold? Yeah, certainly. This has been, you know, student debt has been an issue for young voters uh, you know, before the war. So uh, th they're trying to demonstrate, even if it doesn't get done, hey, I did everything I could. Even when the Supreme Court turned me down, I took a second bite at the apple, tried to get this debt relief uh, for these young voters. But uh, look, I, I think it's going to be really up to what is in the news cycle as we get closer to the election. The war is very uncertain. Is this going to be such a live ball for young voters in October, November, as it is now? And also, where does the debt relief stand? Has the court blocked it? Is that going to cause more frustration? You know, these are all questions uh, that are going to be really crucial uh, in the months ahead. Yeah. Messaging from the White House over the weekend on the matter of Israel, National Security Council spokesman John Kirby uh, got to the matter on ABC this week. Here he is. We have been increasingly frustrated. And again, that was uh, a core message that the president delivered to Prime Minister Netanyahu in their phone call this week, this past week, that if they've got to do more, they've got to make changes. Now, the prime minister assured the president that he would do that. We've seen some announcements in those early hours. That's welcome. We've got to see more. We've got to see it over time. There were signs of progress today. Benjamin Netanyahu says there is a date for the invasion of Rafah. Does that stop the impression of progress? It's hard to tell. I mean, there were 300 aid trucks, I think the U.S. said, that went in today, which is the highest number. They say they want to see that continue. And as for the Rafa invasion, it's hard to tell if that is a you know, negotiating ploy. You have right. to remember all these parties have been at the table in Cairo, mm -hmm. Hamas, Qatar, Egypt, U.S., Israel on this hostage deal. Is this Netanyahu trying to apply, uh, you know, some leverage there or is this an actual invasion plan? It's sort of hard to tell. Mm -hmm. you know, he did withdraw some troops from other areas of Gaza over the past few days. Uh, th there's also a question of are they repositioning forces mm -hmm. for a rough invasion or is this them backing off? A lot of fog of war, but uh, certainly uh, the, it's a tinderbox. It's, it's t as tense as ever. Yeah, and of course, saying there is a date is very different than actually giving a date at which this will be happening. Bloomberg's Jordan Fabian, thank you so much, as always. Now, still coming up, we'll have more on the issues of Israel, abortion, and the others that are shaping the 2024 presidential race. Cliff Young of Ipsos Polling will be with us next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Reactions from some of Donald Trump's allies and former allies have not been favorable to the former president after his abortion announcement earlier today, in which he said the power to decide abortion policy should reside with the states. His former vice president saying, quote, President Trump's retreat on the right to life is a slap in the face to the millions of pro-life Americans who voted for him in 2016 and 2020. Joining us now for more is Cliff Young, Ipsos U.S. Public Affairs president. So Cliff, as he talks about, Mike Pence talks about, the voters who were behind Trump in 2016 and 2020 who may not like the fact that he did not support any kind of weak term uh, in terms of a federal abortion ban. How should we think around American attitudes on this issue? Is it actually likely that more people would like what the president, former president had to say this morning than those who will be unhappy with it? I think the, I think the former president is crazy like a fox. He knows that abortion is a losing issue. Um, if you look at the polling uh, globally, that is across the United States, you look at it in the states, um, there's widespread sort of discontent with the, with the actual um, uh, position today. Only 40 percent of people support abortion at 16 weeks, even less so at five weeks. Um, and so America is not where the GOP is today. And I believe the former president, Trump, understands that. Why go near it if you stand to lose evangelicals, which are part of the real Trump base? That's supposed to be a, a voting group that he can count on here. And he now threatens to lose some of these voters, maybe not to Joe Biden, but they might not show up at all if they don't think Donald Trump is convincingly on their side. He had a, a win with evangelicals on this issue. Could he stand to lose it? Well, I think the calculus is they're going to stay with me no matter what. Mm -hmm. And where I'm really hurting is with suburban women, um, moderate Republicans. Indeed, though, that's the profile of voter um, that's supporting uh, RFK right now, as an example. Um, they're orphans right now. And so I think the calculus, calculus is, what can I do to bring them back into the fold? Because I need them come election day. Well, we know that the Biden campaign has really made one of its focal talking points, if you will, around the abortion issue or reproductive rights, as it seems they're trying to frame it now. The other big contrast, though, they're trying to draw with former President Trump is on the issue of democracy. And we've been asking this question repeatedly about whether or not that's really something that resonates if a lot of voters are more concerned with what's happening at the border. But your polling actually suggests that essentially ex political extremism and the fate of democracy are the number one issue. Yeah. By the way, that surprised us. Yeah. And, uh, and, me and too. actually, it wasn't in our ba battery of polling, um, historically speaking. Uh, but what we thought was important is try to capture what the Democrats and Biden were doing. They're really hammering home, doubling down on that message. And what do we find? Uh, the economy is no longer the number one issue. It is saving democracy. And it's an issue that resonates not just with Democrats, but independents as well. Uh, uh, as well. That's good for Biden. One last point. What do we know based upon lots of elections, lots of data out there? The candidate strongest on the main issue right now saving democracy, mm. wins the election 85% of the time. Now, obviously, we have a, lot, a long road to go. We'll see what happens by Election Day. But that's a good thing for Biden. Well, is this a Democratic issue? A lot of Republicans answer polls by saying that Joe Biden is a threat to democracy. And a lot of the talking points we hear, for instance, lawmakers on Capitol Hill tell us that on a regular basis. Yeah, it's framed slightly differently. It's about a broken system mm -hmm. and having a strong leader to take back a broken system. So it, it's two sides of the same coin, coin framed slightly differently. Weaponization of government. Weaponization of democracy yeah. um, in general. On both sides, they see the other side doing that. Both sides idea. think the other side is politically motivated when they do things. Um, legal, uh, Trump's legal trou troubles, for instance, are seen as nothing more than politically motivated uh, a chaos, let's say, or an attack. Um, but yes, we're in a strange time right now where democracy itself is a campaign uh, theme. Well, so you describe this as something that is working in the incumbent president's favor. There's a lot of things that aren't working in his favor, though, including Israel. We were just talking about how young voters and vote Arab and Muslim Americans have shown this in protest votes in the primary, not satisfied with the president's policy when it comes to Gaza. How problematic will that be for him? Is this something that voters ultimately will vote on in the general election, not just in, in protest in the primaries? Yeah, it's an Achilles heel for Biden, and it should be uh, something they worry about, the campaign and Biden worries about. Now, I, I do think that inflation trumps that, and so when you look at the two issues, among younger Americans especially, it's really inflation that's driving the problem 
with Biden's numbers, not the issue in Israel. That's not to say it's not important. Um, I think they'll shore that up. Obviously, they're trying to change the scenario in the region uh, to help them by Election Day. Uh, but I think those are individuals that typically vote uh, constituencies that typically vote Democratic, um, I think they'll be brought into the fold uh, by, by Election Day. How do you qualify what we heard from the president today? He's coming back around on student loan debt forgiveness. You could call that an economic issue, a personal finance issue. Uh, maybe that's a big brother issue. Where does that fall in the questioning as you talk to voters, realizing that this may never see the light of day when it comes to appealing to young voters who would otherwise stay home if they didn't have something like that they could wrap their arms around. It's targeted at the same group that criticizes him for, for, for Israel, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Younger Americans. Sure. He's had a problem. He's had a problem, as I've already said, because of inflation, also because of, because of Gaza slash Israel. And this is, an, or, uh, in my mind, I'm, as I see it, this is, a, um, this is basically a strategy of his to bring this subgroup, this constituency, so back into the fold. they cancel each other out? I don't know. <laughs> perhaps, uh, yeah, perhaps. But but ultimately, it's a big deal to have your student, uh, you know, sure debt is. sort of forgiven. So, well, obviously, Cliff, we talk primarily about Trump versus Biden, Republican versus the Democrat. But there are third party factors here in included and inclusive in your polling. I noticed when you add RFK into the mix, he gets 16 percent of the vote. <laughs> Trump gets 32. Biden gets 31. They're essentially almost even. So how should we be thinking about him as a factor? You know, once again, disaffected Americans, ambivalent Americans, they don't like either option. <laughs> but, but supporters of RFK tend to be right of center, more female, more suburban, mm. maybe sort of Dobbs orphans. Once again, going back to our, our conversation about abortion, um, this is a place ripe for Biden to take advantage, mm. and it's a problem for Trump. So polling votes from Trump. Polling votes for Trump. He got 16 yeah. percent. Ross Perot got 19 percent. That's where we are here. Yeah, That's a I, significant impact. That, that is. It, it just suggests, you know, that we're in a complicated place today. Yes. We have a lot of, like, ambivalence about the choices that, that are there on the table, right? Fascinating. Our experience, though, is that over time it tapers off. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe this will be halved by Election Day. Right. Sometimes you overstate uh, at the beginning and you start thinking about you know, the value of your vote. Maybe you don't want to feel like you threw your vote away. Mm -hmm. uh, so I expect this to change by Election Day. We expect to see you before then. Okay, <laughs> Many great. times, I'm sure. Thank you, as always. <laughs> Ipsos, U.S. Public Affairs President with us at the table today. Thank you, Cliff. Coming up, we'll wrap up Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's China trip, her second in nine months. Tom Orlick of Bloomberg Economics is on the way in next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. China is now simply too large for the rest of the world to absorb this enormous capacity. Actions taken by the PRC today can shift world prices. And when the global market is flooded by artificially cheap Chinese products, the viability of American and other foreign firms is put into question. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen wrapping up her multi-day visit to China, raising concerns over the country's industrial overcapacity while also trying to normalize relations with the world's second largest economy. Joining us now uh, to pick through this visit, Tom Orlick, Bloomberg Economics chief economist who has been covering China for years and in fact wrote the book on what we're talking about. Uh, Janet Yellen arrives in Beijing and starts to complain about overcapacity. Why should China listen? What motivates China in this case to care? So um, the things Janet Yellen, Secretary Yellen, said have the virtue of being true. Uh, China does have significant overcapacity. Mm -hmm. That is a problem for China. It's also a problem for the United States and the rest of the world. Um, the trouble is that whilst overcapacity is a problem for China, it's also a kind of deliberate strategy for China. They build overcapacity. That enables their firms to outcompete rivals in the US and Europe dominate markets first at home and then in the rest of the world, and that's kind of China's growth strategy. Mm. Um, so Yellen can certainly go to Beijing and raise those concerns, and I'm sure Chinese officials will listen politely. Will they change their decades-long approach after she gets on the plane and heads back to Washington, D.C.? 
My guess is probably not. Yeah. Well, and it's worth keeping in mind that China is investing so heavily in manufacturing and in industrial output because there's weaknesses elsewhere, including in the property sector, for example. Do you need to see those other portions of the Chinese economy improve first before there ever would be a hope of addressing this overcapacity issue? So it's interesting, Kaylee. I mean, real estate is kind of like the poster child mm -hmm. for what happens when overcapacity when goes wrong for China, right? They built all of these houses, too many, yeah. um, and now they're facing the consequences. In the industrial sector, though, as you know, it's a little bit different, right? You can't export your overcapacity real estate to the United States or Europe, but you can export your overcapacity solar panels, mm -hmm. and China hopes in the future they'll be able to export their electric vehicles, mm -hmm. their batteries, and so on. Um, and as you flag, with so many problems in the property sector at home, this isn't a moment where China's going to hold back on those ambitions in manufacturing. Anthony Blinken is headed next, uh, we understand. What did we get out of this meeting? What do we have to show for it, if not just another meeting? So um, I think Secretary Yellen makes a number of compelling points, mm -hmm. right? And also, of course, who knows what happens behind the scenes, what crucial conversations are happening which we don't hear about in public. Um, at the same time, to me, as a somewhat jaded uh, multi-year China watcher, it feels a mm -hmm. bit like the bad old days, right? Mm -hmm. We go to China, we make some high-minded points which are true based on the economics textbook, um, but we don't have any traction with mm -hmm. Beijing, and so we get back on the plane and nothing changes. Yeah. We'll, see if, we'll see what happens after the Yellen visit, yeah. we'll see what happens after the Blinken visit, but that's the danger. Well, and we'll see what happens after the election. We have just about a minute left, Tom, but we have Donald Trump talking about slapping 60% plus tariffs on everything that is coming out of China. That would maybe be a way to address the overcapacity, right? Because why would they be, <laughs> be making supply that is going to be cost so much to export, essentially? Right. So um, I just read the Lighthizer book. Lighthizer was Trump's top trade negotiator. He's the guy who brought the tariffs in Trump's first term. The point he makes pretty forcefully is... You can talk as much as you like, but unless there's a credible threat there, you're not going to get the action you want from other capitals, be that Beijing, be that Brussels. So I think the 60% tariffs which Trump is floating are very much part of that strategy. Of course, they could have significant economic consequence as well. Tom Orlick, Bloomberg Economics Chief Economist, the expert in all things China. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, still coming up, we'll have more on geopolitics and the ongoing conflicts between Israel and Hamas and Russia and Ukraine, especially as Congress returns to Washington with an eye on funding for these allied countries. We'll speak next with Jane Harmon, chair of the National Defense Strategy Commission on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. out of the 24 battalions of Hamas's military have been dismantled, and the four that remain are in Rafah. So the question for Israel is what they're going to do, how and when they're going to go into Rafah. Right now, as I had mentioned, the ceasefire talks are really very close, and there is a huge amount of international pressure, including from the White House. Carmel Arbit of the Atlantic Council talking with us earlier on Balance of Power about the situation on the ground now in Israel. Let's bring in former Congresswoman Jane Harmon, chair of the National Defense Strategy Commission and author of Insanity Defense, Why Our Failure to Solve National Security Problems Makes Us Less Safe. Jane, it's great to see you and welcome back. We'd like to start on the matter of Israel as Benjamin Netanyahu today says there is a date. He didn't tell us what it was uh, for the invasion of Rafa. Do you believe that that date exists or is uh, this some attempt at negotiation? Well, I, I can't say what's in his mind, but I can say that the negotiations, as you just reported it, uh, are intense uh, for the relief of hostages, hopefully at least 40 hostages in exchange for some uh, Palestinian prisoners held in Israel. Uh, I think that's the priority. I think that's what Israeli families need to hear. I think that that is what the world needs to see as at, at least some relief from this uh, very tense and tragic uh, humanitarian situation. Situation. That's rule. That's that's uh, priority number one. Priority number two is humanitarian aid uh, now. 
Priority number three is some kind of a long-range vision for how this goes. Israel is right to want to destroy Hamas leadership, yes, but the means they have chosen has caused untold suffering. And now the issue is, what can the neighbors plus the U.S., uh, plus many in Israel who want this result, uh, like Benny Gantz, who's in the war cabinet, uh, engineer uh, to bring about a long-term solution? I still think it's a two-state solution for two peoples, uh, but that would be my take on that. Let me just say, uh, uh, Joe and Kaylee, that today was a rare moment of, of nonpartisanship with this eclipse. Uh, the whole country seemed to come <laughs> together, and it at least inspires me to think maybe, just maybe, there is some light at the end of this dark tunnel in U.S. politics. Yeah, still, we can find something of a moment of unity, even if it was just for a moment today, Jane. But your point is very well taken at a time when there is a lot that divides us, including, frankly, support for Israel, especially now as you have many Democrats who are unhappy with the civilian death toll in Gaza, do not think that the U.S. should continue to support Israel militarily without conditioned conditions. This is going to be the subject of much debate when the House returns, that you could potentially have aid for Israel tied together with aid for Ukraine and potentially be losing people in both parties on both sides of that issue. How would you advise the House Speaker on his path forward, on, on aid for both of these allies? I think he needs to choose between his personal survival as Speaker and doing the right thing. If he actually does the right thing, he may survive as Speaker with some Democratic votes. Let's understand that a motion to, v to vacate can be brought by one person, and that the tiny margin in the House, if all the Republicans vote that way, takes him out. But Democrats could help him. He has to do the right thing. What's the right thing on Israel? The right thing on Israel is to vote this aid and to push for what I just said, a three-part solution, the hostages, humanitarian aid, and a long-term settlement. What's the right thing on Ukraine? I was in Kyiv uh, for two days last week. I chair the, the Commission on National Defense Strategy. Several of the commissioners were with me. Uh, we were looking in at the aerospace base that Ukraine is building without aid from anyone. But let's understand, they can build low-cost drones for $350 a copy. They can bring build longer-range drones and tanks. But those things will not work without our aid. Uh, there's, they, they need anti-jamming equipment for us for the targeting for the drones. Uh, and they need air cover, long-range fires, plus uh, uh, the Patriot system or some other missile defense system around the country. What is happening right now, as we're talking about all this, is Ukrainians are dying on the battlefield. And uh, uh, Zelensky told David Ignatius of The Post uh, a few days ago that he has to shorten the line. That means shorten the area where he can defend his country, because he doesn't have enough ammo. It's embarrassing. It's pathetic. And the U.S. has pledged this aid. And so far as I know, That's Mike right. Johnson supports the aid. And Mike Pompeo is just urging uh, from outside that we provide this aid. So, so to conclude, I mean, I think Mike Johnson should choose between doing the right thing and surviving, and he should pick doing the right thing, and then he may have a chance to survive. Otherwise, he'll be gone in a few months over some other issue. It is curious, because we also keep hearing, Jane, that the, this bill would pass if it ever got to the floor. It's just a matter of actually getting to a vote. The international community is watching. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg talked with Bloomberg last Friday uh, about the need for the U.S. to send a message to Russia here. Listen to how he phrased his answer, Jane, and we'll have you respond. It is also in the security interest of the United States to prevent uh, President Putin from winning. Uh, and that will send a message to him, but also to President Xi in China, that when they use military force, when they invade another country, uh, when they violate international law, they achieve their uh, aims. Um, that will uh, reduce the threshold for any future use of force. What happens in Ukraine today can happen in Taiwan tomorrow. So therefore, it is in the national security interest of the United States to provide military support to Ukraine. Well, let We've me been add spending two things a chunk to of that. this hour, Jane, <laughs> talking about Janet Yellen going to China. What yeah. does China make of this lack of consensus, right. this sort of endless debate here in Washington? Oh, well, China, you know, makes of it that we are uh, in, in dysfunction, and those are opportunities for China. But let's focus on Ukraine for one minute, just to add to what Stoltenberg yeah. said. Uh, we either, the Ukrainians either beat Russia in Ukraine or we fight Russia in Europe. 
it's not complicated. And when we fight in Europe as part of NATO, we have boots on the ground. We don't have boots on the ground in Ukraine. That's one point. The other point that he didn't make is that 70 percent 70 percent of our, our appropriations for Ukraine stays in the United States. What we're doing is backstopping aerospace firms here who build things in districts. Oh, by the way, there's a tank factory in Louisiana. Is Mike Johnson listening? Uh, build jobs in Louisiana and elsewhere. And we're backstopping them with most of this money. And we're saving not just Ukrainian lives, but we're saving American freedom. Jane, I want to ask you about uh, reporting that we got from the U.N. nuclear watchdog today that warned that the Zaporizhia power plant in Ukraine came, quote, quite close to a nuclear accident yesterday after it was attacked by drones. There was a time where we were talking a lot about the situation at this plant. It seems that it has faded to the background. But how worried should we be about something that could be a catastrophic accident happening, given the operations we're seeing Russia conduct? Well, I wouldn't call it an accident if Russia is deliberately targeting sure. the plant. Uh, I asked about this when we were in Ukraine. The problem is that uh, the, the reactor is on to protect the core from melting down. It's, it's not functioning beyond that. But if the core melts down of this nuclear reactor, that's nuclear material, it gets in the water table, it will poison the people in some area around it. But also, if, just if, there is some radiation that comes after that or along with that, that radiation can move toward Russia, depending on the wind, or it can move toward NATO. And there is a fair question about whether radiation that comes from a power plant that's been deliberately attacked mm -hmm. by Russia uh, and uh, wafts over the airspace of NATO countries could be considered uh, an event that would trigger Article 5. I mean, this mm. is highly dangerous stuff. And, uh, and this uh, illegal, wrong war uh, is leading to consequences we don't know yet. But the crucial fact right now is for Congress to do something it should have done eight months ago, that the Senate did two months ago, uh, with support from 22 Republicans. Let the House move now. Re uh, Ukrainians are dying now, and Americans will die later if they don't act. Well, it could be weeks, we understand, Jane, before a Ukraine funding bill hits the floor of the House. We were told this window was closing at the beginning of the year. What is the real yeah. situation? It's going to take time once they approve this money. You obviously know a lot about this, having served to the capacity that you did in Congress. The wait, even if they approve this today, will continue in Kyiv. Well, if they approve the version that the Senate passed overwhelmingly, I just mentioned that, including 22 Republican votes with strong support from Mitch McConnell, uh, the minority leader, and Susan Collins, who is the chair, uh, chair of the, the ranking member on the House Appropriations Committee who managed the bill, if they approve that version, then they don't need a conference. Then that goes yeah. to President Biden, who would sign it quickly. He's already said that he would. And that version, uh, whether it's perfect or not, includes tough border protections, which the Republicans have said all along that they want and which Biden will implement. So, I mean, why can't they take yes for an answer? And if that is approved immediately, aid will start to flow. I don't think it's months or weeks. I don't know how many months or weeks we have uh, before uh, this thing goes drastically south. And so I, I just say, uh, you know, uh, to Mike Johnson, choose. Choose between your le doing the right thing and, and saving yourself, you might get both or you might get neither. All right, Jane Harmon, chair of the National Defense Strategy Commission, thank you so much, as always, for joining us here on Bloomberg. We appreciate thank your you. time. And coming up, we'll be joined next by our political panel, Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano, to take us through Donald Trump's stance on abortion and the reaction we're getting on both sides of the aisle. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Tens of millions of people's debt was literally about to get canceled. But then some of my Republican friends and elected officials and special interests sued us, and the Supreme Court blocked us. But that didn't, well, that didn't stop us. 
That was President Biden speaking in Madison, Wisconsin today. It's where he announced the White House's new student loan forgiveness plan. This marks the administration's latest attempt to cancel debt after its initial proposal was blocked by the Supreme Court, as the president just alluded to. For more, we're joined now by Rick Davis and Jeannie Shan. They know our Bloomberg politics contributors. Jeannie, just to begin with you, as you are also a professor at uh, Iona University, you are around young people all of the time. And we know that this is a demographic that while Biden could rely on them in 2020, it seems different this time around. Is this issue his best chance of bringing those people back into his corner? I think it's an important issue. I mean, uh, we, we can all agree the cost of a college education in this country is absolutely outrageous. And so it is something that needs to be addressed. But I don't see this as something that people are really going to vote on in the end. It is something that people, particularly young people, may support if they were to see the benefits of it. But in this case, it looks like even if he is able to push this forward, there are going to be so many lawsuits and challenges to it that it's unlikely we see anything before November. So I think it's something the president wants to say he is still committed to, but I'm not so sure in the end it changes how people vote in this election. That's kind of the point here, though, isn't it? We've already seen how the Supreme Court feels about this idea in principle, Rick. So you, you know, put a new frame around this and kick it out there so you can run on this issue, hold on to this issue that Joe Biden otherwise might have lost. Yeah, it's arguable that Joe Biden's strategy in all these key targeted states is to run up the tab in these college towns. They tend to be more Democratic leaning. They, this is where the base Democratic vote is located. And so, you know, a feel good thing like this, regardless of if you actually get your student loan mm -hmm. uh, 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 cleared up, and I think the rulemaking doesn't even go into effect until July of 2025. Yeah. He's talking about doing something for you. I feel your pain. It's too much of a burden. I'm going to fix that burden if I'm president. And then, by the way, if you believe him, you sure as heck want him to be president because mm -hmm. I don't think Donald Trump will let that program stand <laughs> if he's elected president of the United States. Well, of course, a lot of this ultimately will probably come down to the decision of a court or multiple courts. And, of course, the court has already ruled on a constitutional right to abortion with the overturning of Roe v. Wade. That happened under the Trump administration. And today, when he early Earlier outlined his stance on abortion now, he not only touted that the Dobbs decision came under his watch, but instead of supporting anything at the federal level, said it should be up to the states. Here he is. Many states will be different. Many will have a different number of weeks, or some will have more conservative than others, and that's what they will be. At the end of the day, this is all about the will of the people. Not everyone seems thrilled with uh, this stance today, Rick, including members of the president's own party, Mike Pence, his vice president, Lindsey Graham, the senator from South Carolina, not supportive of this. Is this going to hurt him more than it helps him, ultimately? You know, it probably doesn't hurt him with his base, his raw base. They're not going anywhere. It's not like Biden's going to be any better for them. Uh, maybe take a, a little intensity out of the equation, but I think he's using that as a way of trying to look more moderate on this issue than he otherwise would. I mean, what's interesting is we're already seeing commercials being played by the Biden administration, mm -hmm. Biden campaign, sorry, uh, uh, on this issue uh, with Donald Trump saying himself, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to defeat Roe v. Wade. And so what's going to be the difference? Is that what people are going to remember, that Donald Trump put the mechanisms in motion to get rid of Roe v. Wade? Or are they going to remember this kind of fuzzy, I'm not exactly sure where I am on abortion? Um, my guess is this abortion issue with Donald Trump is a check the box right now and move on to something else. It's not a winning issue for him. The more he has to talk about it, the more he gets tied up in knots. Is this all good, Jeannie, uh, for Joe Biden? He keeps the same ads on the air, apparently, and holds on to an issue that he believes is very good for him. Democrats have some pretty big wins to show for that over the past couple of years. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, who do we have here in Donald Trump? He's, you know, something like out of Oliver Twist, the artful dodger. You know, when you say things are going to remain the way they are, the states will decide, well, what does that mean? As of May 1st, if you are a young person living in Florida, that means if you don't seek an abortion and get one before six weeks, when most people don't even know they're pregnant, you are out of luck. And you can't easily go to the rest of the southern states because most of them have restricted them as well. Donald Trump, 
is not even addressing where he stands on the initiative in his own home state. And we're going to hear Democrats ask him over and over. You know, think about the down ballot as well. Rick Scott already said he supports the initiative in Florida. Now he's caught between Donald Trump and that initiative. So this is what it has always been for the Republicans. They they really it have found themselves in a disaster with abortion when it comes to the ballot box. There is no winning here. And his trying to, you know, be really sort of cagey about this is not going to help anybody. And you're already hearing that from on the right, Mike Pence, and on the left, of course, the Biden administration and most pro-choice groups. Well, maybe a, yet another reason why we never see a debate in the general <laughs> election. Coming up, lawmakers coming back to Capitol Hill this week as impeachment proceedings against one top Biden administration official potentially gets underway this week. Rick and Jeannie will stay with us as lawmakers come back to town. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. On this vote, the yeas are 214 and the nays are 213. The resolution is adopted. This Republican Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, back in February after the House narrowly voted to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. Some time has passed. He's, he faces criticism over his handling of the U.S.-Mexico border in the next phase of proceedings would be set to kick off this week in the Senate. That's when they're going to bring the articles across the rotunda for what would be a trial. For more on what is actually next, uh, we reassemble our panel. Rick Davis, partner at Stone Court Capital, Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University, uh, with us here. Uh, Rick, this is not expected to go anywhere. Uh, whether this is dismissed outright or goes to die in committee, I'm compelled by the optics here, this impeachment trial and waiting in the Senate, even as Alejandro Mayorkas himself is brought back to Capitol Hill to testify to promote Joe Biden's new budget for his Department of Homeland Security. How do we rationalize what's going on here? There's not going to be a trial, right? And he will continue to promote the administration's policies. Well, if you try to rationalize anything that happens in Washington, <laughs> you're probably out of luck. Uh, this Waste is a just, lot of time. On this it. is just another kabuki dance that's made its way down to the floor of this, the House of Representatives. Have you heard in your clip? Uh, you know, one vote margin. Yes. Uh, right along party line, and 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 it just reminds everybody that this initiative that the Senate worked so hard to craft, you know, that had within the the supplemental a uh, really significant amount of effort around the border security, border uh, plan, mm -hmm. with funding for it, um, was dashed by the same people who are, you know, impeaching the head of the Homeland Security for his conduct on the border. So none of it makes any sense. You couldn't, you couldn't explain this to a seventh grade class <laughs> and, and without being criticized. So at the end of the day, the Senate will do the last event in line with this uh, impeachment, and that is to ignore it and kick it to the curb. Mm -hmm. And that's where it should have started, and that's where it'll end this week. Well, Rick, you, you mentioned that bipartisan border deal. It, of course, was what was being given, essentially, in exchange to secure Ukraine funding, Jeannie. And that is still a question we'll be grappling with when the House returns tomorrow. The Speaker, Mike Johnson, has teased that after the Easter recess, he would put something pertaining to Ukraine aid on the floor. But there's a lot of other things he needs to deal with as well, including the reauthorization of FISA. What, how would you rank his priorities when he returns to town? You know, number one, probably trying to retain his job. Um, I am one of those that is very skeptical that we see Ukraine funding before the next recess, which, let's not forget, comes what? After next week, we're getting, you know, a two-week recess. They're back for two weeks, and then they go home. I can't imagine we see Ukraine funding before that. Maybe we will. I think, you know, they are going to try this week to tackle the 702 and FISA. That's going to be an uphill battle. He's got Republicans upset about that. So, you you know, I keep saying, you know, I don't think it will happen, but imagine if we end up with a Hakeem Jeffries speaker. It wouldn't be the craziest notion to imagine that that could happen. If, you know, you see Mike Johnson pull a Kevin McCarthy, he gets thrown out of office and he leaves the House, and there we go with Hakeem mm. Jeffries. I mean, it has gotten that crazy. And the sham impeachment you were just talking about is just another in a long line of examples. Uh, modern day Washington. <laughs> 
You got to love it. Jeannie Shan Zeno and Rick Davis, thank you both so much for joining us this evening. And of course, for more co coverage of the craziness that is Washington, check out the Washington Edition newsletter on the terminal and online. You sound exhausted. It's only Monday <laughs> in Washington. Yeah. They'll be back tomorrow. We'll be here too. Meet us back in this very same place on Balance of Power. For Kaylee Lines, I'm Joe Matthew on Bloomberg TV and radio.